el santuario del rock. Our first question has to do with the title of the album, Of the Dark Lights. Is there any special meaning behind this title? Okay, basically the concept is the concept is more about the negative side of what we feel as life. You know what I mean? So in in the in the aspect of death, we transcend and we don't know whether or not we're in a world of light or in a world of dark. We just don't know. So that's really kind of the meaning behind it. It means of the dark light is more about the negative universe than it is about anything else. This hidden ambiguity behind it. Yeah, exactly. When you take a look at the album cover, you see that there is a magnificent and impressive picture. The design was carried out by Colin Marx. There is a particular aesthetics as far as his artwork designs are concerned. What was the motivation for you to hire him for this assignment? Uh we don't want to always make the same exact album cover. I mean, um, you know, we do have some pretty technical album covers. Cheers. I'm getting ready to have a little drink over here. Um, we, we do do, um, you know, we basically hired him um, out of the aspect that he had done some t-shirts for us. And he just he makes some pretty good artwork. And, um, you know, we wanted to try somebody different. We had used John Zig. We had used, you know, Dan Seagrave. We had Hiro Takahashi. We had a you know, Rain and Swampland. So just, um, we were looking to do something a little bit different. And, um, you know, we ran our ideas by him after, you know, working with him on some t-shirts and it just seemed like a good fit, you know? Would you please explain its concepts? Well, it, it, it's more about transcending into the ether, you know? If you have the, if you have the whole cover, you realize a person whose spirit is being, is coming through his body, his body is being deteriorated and as it goes on and it, eventually reaches the cosmos, you know what I mean? Going, you know, interdimensionally. And, you know, it's meant to show a little bit of the transformation that goes on in that idea. You know, it's still very subjective up to the up to the person who's the listener or the person who's looking at the cover. It's not meant to be just sent to somebody in one particular direction. But it's just meant to show how he evolves into the ether and not necessarily into heaven or hell or one or the other. You know what I mean? Yeah, and probably as any other piece of artwork, it's open to individual interpretation. Yeah. Um, it's a different style for suffocation, you know, but as a band, we, you know, we want to grow and we want to try different ideas as well. And I think that uh, it came across pretty well from, from what it, you know, originally started as. So Colin did a pretty great job. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's uh, rather mystical. We like it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well, as regards the recording of the album, we've got the name of uh, Kevin Muller. Was there any special reason behind uh, yep. uh, the decision of making him part of the process? What's his status <laughs> of the band? Um, well, he's going to be filling in for Frank Mullen when he can't be doing the touring, obviously, because, uh, you know, Frank is leaning towards more, more retirement as he gets older. Um, you know, there's a lot more responsibilities on his plate for him, kids, full-time job, the whole nine. So it makes it very hard for him to tour with the band, even though that he's always a part of it. And, um, you know, he's heard Kevin sing. We all have a common mutual rehearsal room where we jam with a lot of bands here on Long Island. Um, we have, we know a lot of musicians here. It's a pretty like little family out here. And uh, he just, he, he's a kick-ass singer and He's been a friend of ours for a while, and he just seems to be a good fit, you know? So while we were in the studio, we figured, hey, what the hell, let's get him on there. <laughs> yeah. But he'll also be filling in when Frank can't tour, you know what I mean? Because Frank can't do all the touring. So I have somebody, and he's pretty awesome. So. Yeah, there's no question about his talent, but Frank's still the front man. How complicated can it be to manage the changes and the diversity of things? Well, I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, it is an issue from the standpoint of the fan because, you know, they just want to see Frank Mullen, which is great. And I mean, I would love to see Frank Mullen all the time, too. He's been one of my best friends for 30-something years. But, um, you know, as he gets older and as time goes on, you know, you got to take a more mature outlook and... You know, it's all work no matter what we do. So in order to have somebody, you know, 
take on the role of being a front man for this band in light of somebody else is, is a tough thing. But you know what? It's all music, so we're going to do that anyway. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It, it, it's an undertaking, but, you know, it, it has its ups and it has its downs, and we just roll with the punches for what we're dealt. That's just the way it is. Yeah, well, I would describe it like uh, they enrich the whole picture and they make uh, valuable contributions. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So that's what we're looking at right now. Well, your fan base has been waiting for a release for about four years now, and uh, now you reappear into the scene with your latest release. Uh, is there any word or any adjective that could describe the whole process of producing this record? Well, I mean, there's no real just one word to describe it. I mean, we do have uh, some good people we've been working with, so we figure not to like really change too much um, in that aspect because it's more convenient for us. As we're older, it's harder to, for us to travel, to go to one spot, to do things. Um, members from the band don't necessarily live next to each other. So it's hard to get people together <clears throat> and we have a common spot that we uh we always use with engineers that we always try to use so um for us it was it was pretty much you know going with the flow of what we normally would do especially over like the last three or four records but um other than that that's the main reason you know that we go to full force studios with Justin Cotter. i mean we've been with him for a very long time now There's no reason to really go much other places to do our tracking and things and uh we've used uh chris juice harris to do the mixing and mastering for it and you know he's done a lot of great bands like lamb of god and Hate breed and so on and so forth so it's good for us to be able to work with with these people and get a good common ground and a good workflow out of the whole thing just to make the recording happen you know talking about how to write new material um if you took a look back uh, to the way you used to write new material and if you compare that to the way you write new material now how would you compare these two moments for example we as fans can probably say that technicality is ever present in suffocation compositions nowadays how would you describe your own approach to composing new material yourself and how it has been changing throughout the years well, okay. <laughs> well, with the change, I mean, for us in the beginning, it was like we were able to do an album or two every other year. There wasn't as much touring involved. And as uh, time has gone on, because now this is almost 30 years later, um, you know, the music industry has changed with downloading and things like that. So bands have to tour more in order to stay, to stay afloat. And with that being said, um, for us, we have to write kind of in pieces. We really can't write on the road. So when we got have our off time, we immediately start writing. So right after Pinnacle of Bedlam was recorded in 2013, we started writing for Of the Dark Light right after it. And then uh, just for example, even though that Of the Dark Light is out, we've already started writing riffs for our next. Season. So, you know, it's a continuous process. And when we're on the road, we're in on the road play mode when we get home we're in the writing mode you know what i mean mm -hmm. and that's why it took a little bit longer for this record to come out because we did quite a bit of touring for pinnacle of bedlam and we kind of had to take a little bit of time off last year just to do the rehearsal part of 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 the dark light before we even entered the studio yeah well those are two different things anyhow I guess uh, both of them contribute to the same goal in different yes, ways. Yeah, and it takes a little bit longer now only because, you know, the band has to survive more off of playing mm -hmm. and doing the shows and getting out to the places where we haven't been as opposed to being able to go, okay, we can do this one tour, you have off the rest of the year and you're just writing for that whole year. Now we're doing four or five tours a year and only having off like maybe, you know, a couple of weeks in between tours. Which in turn, you know, you write a little bit there, you go back out on the road. You come home, you write a little bit there, you go back out on the road. So it's a different approach in, in writing nowadays only because there's not as much space. You know what I mean? We used to have a lot more time, like free time as a band. It was harder in the beginning to go out and play shows and get tours and stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of that time you were just sitting there producing material. Now it's like you're on the road all the time. <laughs> 
And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of space. There's not a lot of quiet. There's no place for you to really think or to express your idea to your guys. So you kind of have to wait until you get home. Yeah, I guess uh, that yeah. that also has an impact on uh, on your routines and how how you organize you, you, your work in exactly. between. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's always, you know, you're always trying to think ahead. You're always trying to solicit the bands that you'd like to play with. You're always trying to get your management to do, to do the things that you really need them to, especially with booking agencies and promoters. And there's a lot of business involved in it as well. And as, you know, as time goes on and people know more of the band after all these years, there's a lot more to, to there's a lot more to handle other than just being the musician in the band, which is what every musician tries to play music for. You know what I mean? We just want to play. We don't want to have to be the business guy about it. But unfortunately, you know, it, it comes hand in hand. You have to have your hand in your band business in order to make sure that you're doing the right thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, you have to keep all the place spinning at the same yeah. time, so to speak. That, that, that's right. Yeah, you have to keep your, you have to keep yourself open to new things. <laughs> <laughs> so, engineer and producer Joe Sincoda has been working with you since so City Night. If I'm not mistaken, this is yes. the fifth product with him. Is there anything you like, particularly with him, about the workflow that you've developed? I mean, we've just known Joe for such a long time. Um, you know, he knows our sound. He was our live sound guy right out of college. He's done plenty of bands now, you know, he's gained a lot of experience through us, with us, and with other bands at this point. And it's just it's it's just a natural fit. He's in our general click of things. He lives right down the road from me, you know. So when we do when we do things like that, we take that into consideration before we're gonna turn around and like, let's say fly to California to a recording studio or go to Florida for a recording studio. Um, when we can just do that at home, you know what I mean? So it's kind of real homegrown, like everything is homegrown about suffocation for it being for New York and for East Coast of the United States, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a pride thing. <laughs> uh, watching the development of the band in retrospective now, Dave Colrus and Kevin Talley have been part of, of the band. How would you describe their participation now if you take a look back? Um, I mean, I appreciate everything that those guys have done. I mean, everything, you know, working with them has never been a a negative issue. It's not like somebody, we, you know, was kicked out of the band or, or it was a sticky thing. It was just like, you know, the guys and, and those guys, especially Kevin and uh, Dave, you know, I expect to see them the next time that I'm out on the road and we'll be hanging out. But um, they, they always added a different element to Suffocation's live show with a little bit different style and groove for the songs that we play. And I mean, Dave has made, you know, multiple contributions to Suffocation with their albums and his drum playing over the years. So, I mean, between the both of them, they're both great drummers. You know, I've been very fortunate to have some really, really talented drummers. Whether or not I've had more than one, that's, that's a different issue. But all the ones that I have had in this band are, are you know, top notch. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it, it is actually such lineup changes that brought uh, Eric and Charlie along now. Um, yeah. How how would you say their integration in, into the band uh, is working now? Since, uh, as um, far as I know, uh, writing new material had already begun when they arrived. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, the majority of the material was already written before that they arrived, but... Um... You know, we, we've we been doing pre-productions and, and things of that, so all the guys, when they came into the band, did have a general knowledge on the material. And, you know, in the aspect of uh, us talking about the material, changing the material, doing different things with it, um, having their input on some of the, you know, arrangements and stuff, it's worked out really well. I mean, they're really good musicians. They understand what's going on, so it's not like... Uh, it's that much of a change. The hardest part is just all the teaching and learning and bringing everybody up to speed with the band at this point, you know, but they've, they've worked their ass off over the last year. Well, for Eric over the last year and for Charlie over the last two years. So I think it shows on the record and in the recording and I hope everybody enjoys it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, in our humble opinion, Guy and you constituted a solid guitar duo. 
Uh, how would you yeah. compare that chemistry with the with the one you've developed with Charlie Erga now? Well, I think that um, both of them have a different style, of course. Uh, but in in that same thing, they're both very adept musicians, so they have a very much similar common ground. You know, um, especially with me and playing, you know, playing along with me and not having to learn them and them learn what we're doing. It's a whole different the whole different thing. But I mean, they both have different elements. Like Guy has a very melodic guitar solo sound where Charlie is a little bit more aggressive, he likes to use the bar a little bit more. Um, so there is subtle differences, but all in all, it, I think that at this point, like as far as tightness goes, we're, we're doing better than we were, you know? Yeah. Um, well, uh, you've been a couple of times uh in South America and especially in Colombia. Have you got any yep. special memories about your visits down there? Um, I mean, it, well, yeah, I mean, traveling from, from Bogota to Armenia was uh, an interesting one, going to, you know, through the mountains, driving through there. Um, unbelievable scenery, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's something that we don't normally see here in New York like that. Um, also, the fans, you know, they're out of their minds down there with you guys. So we really love coming down there to play. Um, food is always great down there. We got our buddy Andreas Montoya, who's always down there and comes and hangs out with us. What up, Andreas? <laughs> um, you know, it's really, <laughs> it's really, it's really a good time being down there, coming and playing for you guys, man. We really look forward to it. Hopefully, at the end of the year, we'll be down there to come and play for you guys again. Well, we hope so too. Any other plans touring in South America? Maybe other countries besides Colombia? We're, well, we're actually working on trying to get a tour down there now um, for the end of the year. So hopefully that'll all pan out. It's still tentative, but we're working on it. And then, uh, you know, after Morbid Angel, we'll be off for one month. Then we go over to Europe to do festivals with Power Trip. Then after that, it's supposed to be South America. And then we're working on another either European or, or uh, American tour for early part of next year. So we have quite a few things in the works for the end of the year. Keep an eye out. We should be down there, you know, sometime at the end of the year, man. El Santuario del Rock. What's going on in Colombia? This is Terrence from Suffocation, and you are checking out Santuario Rock. El Santuario del Rock te trae información exclusiva de tus artistas predilectos. Sí. 